It was very cold. <laughs> I flew down last night. We had to take the docks out of the lake because it all freezes up there. And it was uh, almost freezing by the time I took the docks out this weekend. So it's a real pleasure to be here. And I thank Jan for inviting me to talk to you a little bit about some of the vision we have and where we're going to go at MD Anderson from a digital enablement perspective. I'm going to draw a fair bit uh, on the work I've done in the past, but uh, it's always good to learn uh, and of what you've done and where you're going to go moving forward. The topic is going to really uh, orient you a little bit to the concept of a learning health system, a paradigm that's not my idea, but many others' ideas, and to start to think about what the digital architecture is for such an enterprise. How do we think about building ourselves as a healthcare organization to be something that can learn from every patient that we see to impact the care of the next one, or actually discover basic fundamental elements associated with disease. And arguably, it's not just about a lot of data. Uh, the big data thing is exciting. You've all heard it. Uh, I mean, it's not been around that long, but it, as a topic, it's been around. It's, it's, it's a conversation piece, but we have to really move beyond that and start to think about the processes. A lot of people who have helped out uh, on some of these slides, reflecting, of course, I've only been in my job for five weeks. So I, I, I can't really talk about everything I've done so far at MD Anderson, so I'll project a little bit. So big data, you've all heard about it. I mean, I think it means when you exceed the capacity of an Excel spreadsheet, that's what it was everybody's definition for a while. And it's actually a fairly new term. It came out in 1989, Larson's Harper's referencing junk mail, and that's uh, probably appropriate in many ways, and then developed into a paradigm around business in Laney in 2001. And he's actually the one that actually started to talk about the dimensions of big data, the volume of the data, the velocity of the data, and the variety of the data. And it was really in the context of business. And this is where it came from. If you think about this moving forward now, we're now in a state where it's not just about that much, a lot of data. It's becoming a continuous flow conversation. And it's not about just getting insight out of a single set of data so we can publish a paper, but it's really becoming a conversation around how we continuously move that data at volume how we build platforms to allow that data to flow, to extract insight, and to inform. And I'm sure many of you have seen this graphic courtesy of IBM where it's gone from volume, velocity, variety, and now veracity, which is the uncertainty associated with data. As we start to see it come through, we have inconsistencies in the data and the conversations around quality and data engineers. That entire paradigm is becoming important. So it's not about that big chunk of data that you're going to get your PhD thesis from anymore. It's about building systems that continuously flow large volumes of data, large volumes of complex data. In the context of healthcare, the veracity topic is huge because the decisions that you're making associated with data affects individual patients in their care, in their lives, and so on and so forth. And it's really hard to get good statistics when there's such individuality uh, we're dealing with in the context of healthcare. And it's going to get bigger faster. The rate at which new data sources are going to be onboarded into healthcare and other domains is getting faster and faster. It's been a dramatic drop in the cost of measurement. We measure things at a dramatically lower price than ever before. I mean, every one of you has a mobile device, more than likely. You're videoing the slides, for example. Measurement cost has plummeted, and we're going to have more and more data, to the point that actually adding devices into systems manually, curating them as a list, won't be the way it is. And we're seeing that from a cybersecurity world where we automatically detect the devices in a discovery mode and onboard them. Hospitals, just MD Anderson, for example, have about 70,000 devices that are active in the platform at any point in time. We know that from a security perspective, but now we need to think of what does that mean from a data aggregation, from a tracking of information perspective. And in the context, you can see not just different devices from an IoT perspective, but also individual sequence, sequence and the rich data associated with it. And then the reality is, I think, as we move along, first of all, it's distributed in its aggregation, but it's also, a lot of it's going to lie outside the healthcare system moving forward, whether it's your Fitbit or your integrated pacemaker that Medtronics has you feeding off the sensor beside your bed that goes to their cloud. This complexity of this data flow is going to increase. And in fact, in the context of cancer, it becomes even more complicated. It's one of the most complicated diseases we deal with. And that's why I was really happy to join MD Anderson, because I can focus on that as an initiative for me and really start to bring the thinking around digital architecture, data governance, and data science to an organization that's very focused on that. In the context of cancer, an individual patient goes through the process of being imaged, or their tissue is characterized, and we try to 
predict the outcome given a certain treatment. We call that conditional prognosis. So you freeze the characteristics of the patient and the disease and the environment. You apply a certain therapeutic and you predict an outcome. That capacity to predict is critical. I'll talk about it and how it relates to the Hippocratic Oath in a second. That capacity to predict is largely based on the experience of expert clinicians who have in their neural nets over time seen outcomes for certain features of a characteristic of treatment in an individual patient and then have the ability to do prediction. Just like you know, prediction machines we know about that are emerging now. What we're also doing is we're injecting more information into the process. We don't just start a treatment and let them go anymore. Those patients are monitored continuously with imaging methods. They're realizing that they're changing, so the features are now evolving through time. So how well will the prediction systems work as the features are changing through time for the individual? And then by the time we're finished, we've kind of treated everybody differently, which is very hard to classify them, to predict then for the next patient like them in terms of how they'll come out again. So there's not an ergodic system, spatially variant through time, temporally variant, no stable second moments here, so to say, and pulling information out of this pool so that for the next patient you can predict with confidence is extremely challenging. Not just because it's complicated, but you will learn that in fact a lot of the data is not the highest quality. Not every MR scanner makes the same image. Not every radiologist does the same conclusion from the same image, for example. And one of the worst things is that we don't actually get the outcomes. So the input features and the prediction is the actual outcome. We don't actually collect that in the care process. And finally, of course, if you just think about how much information, it really exceeds human capacity to try to bring these elements together. Hippocrates is kind of the you know, father of modern medicine a long time ago, obviously. But this great quote, obviously been translated from Greek, I presume, wasn't talking in English. He says, the best thing, in my opinion, for the physician to apply himself diligently to the art of foreknowing. That's the idea of having an individual patient, understanding their context, the, the disease and their environment, and saying, if you get this intervention, I think this is the outcome. It's fundamental to medicine. Now, like, that's pretty tough to do now. I mean, maybe you had a few variables you could have in the past. I don't know how much measurement Hippocrates was doing when he was practicing medicine, but now it's very challenging. This is a great slide uh, from uh, Abernathy, this figure from Abernathy, where it basically highlights the facts per decision in medicine you know, is dramatically exceeding human cognitive capacity. If you ever try to make a choice, once you have about five different variables you're trading off, you're doing pretty good. By the time you get to six, you're probably coupling those variables together and making it five again, or you're forgetting about one pretty hard for a human to weigh off more than five different pieces of input in the decision-making process. If you look at over time, the amount of information that's now being exposed in the decision-making process it overwhelms human cognitive capacity. Yet we still expect the physicians to make great decisions and we expect them to make the right decision. It's probably contributing to some burnout in medicine. Maybe you've heard about that. And this is accelerating new features, rapid technology-associated changes, and in fact, in the context of cancer, a lot of the treatments are sitting on previous treatments. So you don't just have that disease and the patient in the context, you have the disease, the patient, the context, their previous treatments and their diagnosis. This is a hard problem. We need to change gears. Even further, this is an old problem that hasn't been addressed. Back in 1996, Institute of Medicine highlighted the fact that in 1996, there is more to know more to manage, more to watch, more to do, and more people involved than any time before in medicine. So if you look at the pressure of growing information, expectations of performance, the need for safety and performance, we've got to have a gear change. This ain't going to work if we keep going this direction. And I'm not the only one that recognizes it, and I'm many others, and I've learned from them. The Institute of Medicine in particular highlights that, in fact, the process of our care delivery and our science is not yielding enough progress. There's a recent article um, in the Washington Post regarding the lack of progress in the context uh, of, of cancer in particular. But it's quite you know, helpful to see instead of medicine sort of highlighting the fact that we're not managing the insights well, we're not applying the evidence well, we're not capturing the outcome, and in fact it's affecting patient experience. But they don't just leave us there, they don't just leave us hanging. 
they actually say, hey, there's an opportunity here, but we have to do some work to get there. And this is their paradigm. It reminds me a little bit about Deming. I'm sure there's a few engineers in the audience. I'm sure you know who Deming was from the point of view of land, do, steady, act. The paradigm here is rather than make it just a pipeline where we're shoving stuff down, why don't we make it much more of a dynamic process? And this is what they refer to as a learning health system, where care you know, gives us some insights to drive science. We test that science and build up evidence, and we return that back to the care paradigm. I mean, it's kind of obvious, it makes a lot of sense. But one of the big challenges was in the context of medicine that most learning was done in the mind of an individual. It was in the expertise of a clinician, and then sharing that information collectively was quite challenging to do. But that's why they kind of ringed it with these zeros and ones, because there's an opportunity for collective learning through the process, by sharing information and using quantitative measures to make decisions and care. So this paradigm, I think, is where we're very much going. And it's clear it's going to save us in terms of cost. It's going to save in terms of lives. They actually go a little further. It's, it's worth reading. I mean, it's, yes, it's almost seven years old. Nowadays, everything has to be new, OK? But it's really worth reading. If you're interested in healthcare, the framing of the problem and the clarity provided by the individuals who wrote this is, is quite striking. They actually break it into four big pieces. And as a data science conference, the first one, I think, should really resonate. They really talk about the need for science and informatics to inform the entire piece. Patient-clinician partnerships has to be a trust capacity there. You need incentives. That's very important, of course, in any kind of paradigm where humans are at work. And then the concept of a continuous learning culture. I'm not going to dwell on the last three, but I'm just going to zoom in on, on the first one. We are not built this way today. Could we actually contemplate a healthcare ecosystem where we're actually built, continuously and reliably capture, curate, and deliver the best available evidence to guide, support, tailor, and improve clinical decision making and care safety and quality? To build real time platforms, real time continuous platforms where we're capturing information during the course of care and learning dynamically from that information. And if you, you know, it's proposed this back in 2010. That would have been really pie in the sky. Now it's still a little bit pie in the sky, but we're seeing technological shifts that may let us pursue this more aggressively. We're seeing it in the context of new technologies like deep learning. We're seeing it in the way we deal with cybersecurity challenges. We're seeing a lot of new technologies emerging from the, from the context of data governance and consent and control. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So given this context, uh, I took this job at MD Anderson in charge of the tech stack what do you think we should be doing moving forward? Should we be you know, buying transactional systems and using forms to plug information in and drive the whole healthcare system? Should we be using billing systems to design and learn? Or should we think differently and take a different approach? And so um, this is MD Anderson. I'm learning the numbers. I've only been there eight, five weeks now, so bear with me. I think these are accurate. I double checked them. One thing that's exciting is we do put a lot of money towards research, and we have a lot of very committed individuals who are completely on the mission. I was in the new employee event, and it was really striking how much people are committed to delivering uh, on, on their mission of making cancer history. Importantly, though, uh, we deliver a lot of very high-quality care, and that's an opportunity for us to learn. It's an opportunity just to execute on quality care, but a huge opportunity for us to learn and to build platforms that learn from those patients and take those insights to treat the next patient better. And of course, you need some expertise and uh, commitment, and it's a, it's a really interesting setting. So if you were thinking about taking that IOM paradigm instead of medicine paradigm and building a tech stack to do it, that's, if you have any ideas, talk to me afterwards, okay? I'm interested, I'm listening. We need a big pool of data scientists that can interact with us. We're gonna need some technology built up, but it's an important mission, and. That's my job, so anybody have good ideas, come talk to me. I'll show you my ideas and we'll go from here. The very first thing is something I refer to as digital alignment. We have to get the digital teams, the IT teams, fully aligned. And digital alignment exists when the organizational infrastructure, architecture, information systems are in harmony with the organization's goals. If you take that mission statement, what is the architecture? Who are the skills? What's the process we need to deliver on that mission statement? And aligned organizations head towards a new way of doing business where technology, people, and process start to blend seamlessly together. Not the 
administrative desires over here and the researchers over here. It should be one single stride together. Is it possible? And I think that the technologies are coming to allow us to think about it. So what is the digital architecture of a healthcare organization built to learn? How could we reframe what we're doing from a transactions and billing based paradigm of keeping information, but to something that actually delivers on the agenda? So I refer to this as, as the big machine. Big data, single shot analytics, get a result. Big data running all the time needs a big machine. So how do we learn a big learning machine? It can't be about single shot analytics. It can't be about the paper that produces a result for a cohort of patients, but because of technologies changing, it doesn't even exist anymore. We want something that can learn continuously so the observations can be relevant to the population directly in front of us, or as irrelevant as possible. So you need data in context. It has to handle the four Vs. It has to support real world data. It has to deal with the rapid expansion of low cost measurements. We have to have the capacity to deal with meaning Machines that can understand meaning, capturing data, putting in a framework so meaning is understood. We have to govern the data. We can't have little silos of protected information. We have to have an understanding of how to govern that information. It needs to be scalable, and it has to have high quality, and you have to actually get the outcomes data at the end, otherwise the features don't predict anything of relevance. You need to close the loop. And frankly, the machine learning has to be a part of it. There's no way a human can absorb the width, the variety of the data. There are features which we do not realize predict for outcome at this point in time, and that's a discovery opportunity. So I kind of sketched it this way. You may have your transactional systems, but the data is big from a whole variety of sources, needs to be qualified, needs to be feature extracted, needs to be made available, not published as in a journal, but published in a way that's findable that information. And once it's findable, you can try to negotiate access. And then in a form that can be interoperated. And maybe we can go back again and test it again for a new algorithm. And at the beginning, maybe it'll be visualized by humans, maybe by machines, and frankly, probably a great human-machine hybrid or machine-human hybrid. That's a debate in between as hypotheses or humans are you know, generated by machines showing interesting correlations. And so there's a bunch of pieces about this. It's moving away from transactional systems to systems that let us aggregate data at scale. I refer to this as the data lakes move to the core. Traditional EMR systems collect, define, but are really limited in the clinical documentation. There's large volumes of raw data, metadata in particular, that are emerging through the process of care that's very hard for us to capture. Platforms that let us aggregate this are going to be key, including things like personal health data. These you know, data lakes, as they're referred to, many of you have heard of them. It's used overused term, but they're flexible, scalable, now indexable. They're re-entrant. You can send data back into them once the observation is generated or an insight. They're secure and they're auditable. And they need support for data governance, provenance, and integrated computational capacity moving forward. And they need to interoperate with algorithms and decision support. So close the loop on learning and change in practice. This kind of approach where the data is flowing not just locked into transactional systems that a human can interoperate with. And the variety is expanding in healthcare. We've gone from genomics to SNPs to deep sequencing. It's not just the genomics, it's the pieces around the genomics, the epigenetics, how the chromosomes are folded, how they're methylated, all becoming very important. Rerunning the sequencing at deep sequencing, giving us new insights from that raw data. Microenvironmental factors and phenomics, the imaging data, if we think genomics is big data, phenomics is massive. It's all the data of the way you are, not just the data of what your genome says you are. That's massive and much more expensive to generate than just a sequencing person. You have to live a life to generate a full phenomics set. That's expensive. I got three kids. I can tell you it's expensive. Also, the variety of data is rich, whether it's IoT information, outcomes, how our data models are going to support this dynamic, you know, new information classification schemes, sort of dynamic ontology concepts, plus time variation. And we'll spend a lot more time storing the information around context than the data itself, because data out of context isn't worth very much. Data in context is really, really important. That's why humans often bring value. This is the number, but let me tell you how I got it. That's data in context. So storing context is going to be just as important 
of storing the data itself. And of course, we're going to have to automate all this. Like I said earlier, if you're from a cybersecurity world, you know about discovery tools. They're watching the network all the time. We know all the devices that are present. Humans keeping track of the devices just doesn't work. And orchestration systems allow us to manage those devices. Those are machines managing the machines moving forward. The other issue is their own quality. I mean, how does a computer interpret this? We might hear it in the next talk. I think it's coming up around image and image analysis. But what does that mean to a computer? I mean, if you, you've been on a website. You bring up a website, a human can read the website. You show a computer the website, it doesn't know what the meaning is. It just has stuff on the screen. It's an interesting piece. The data is also somewhat biased and missing. So building a platform where we're going to learn from every patient requires we start right at the bottom. Are the imaging systems calibrated? Are they certified? Do we know where the data is coming from? That entire tech stack of measurement through to collection, through to insight, has to be managed from bottom to top. And the data scientists have to re realize that managing the uncertainty, intrinsic, in the measurement is key. Otherwise, we have garbage in, garbage out. And unfortunately, human participation in data collection introduces unnecessary variation. Maybe that's not obvious to everybody. <laughs> it's quite obvious to me. And, and the tradition, though, in healthcare is that clinicians collected and curated these data sets, and it's a big value proposition for them. But in fact, it's kind of noisy data and highly likely that it's biased because humans are biased. That's just a reality. So the automation of data collection facilitates the automation of analysis, facilitates the aggregation of insight. So if you start at the bottom and you start to automate the entire platform, you get higher quality data classified correctly, named correctly, so that the computers can interpret, they have the meaning, then they can go on to pursue insights on your behalf. That's pretty powerful. And the way current data is, is clinical research, we have a few patients with lots of data. In clinical registers, we have lots of patients with very little data, but the rest of healthcare is populated like this. And if you started to get in front of this from a data science perspective, maybe you'd start to think about what is the right collection of information? What should I be collecting? What's the design of the experiment to learn as much as possible? How do we spend our resources? So once we start to see the dependence on certain data sets, maybe we'll realize we should be collecting different information. And the reality is we happen to typically collect stuff we can, not necessarily the stuff that's most relevant. So there's a great feedback loop that forms. I won't go too long on ontologies. Probably should speed up a little bit. I love ontologies. If you don't know what ontologies are, look at this slide. Tower of Babel, problem in healthcare. How do we link information? Tim Berners-Lee pushing very hard to bring ontologies to the World Wide Web so machines could read web pages and understand. Right now, we just have humans looking at them and being very happy and kitty videos and stuff like that. But if machines could read websites, the machines could share meaning and be more progressive in their interactions. So he proposed an entire paradigm around learning uh, and the triplet concept. And if you're not comfortable with these, it's worth reading about this. And in fact, now it's coming into healthcare, where in fact, every measurement, every quantity recorded in healthcare can be put into a meaning and linked in terms of a subject par par a predict predicate paradigm. And this is an, an illustration of how an MR test is now tightly defined from a dependency and provenance perspective. And there's an entire architecture now coming out of the web based paradigms through ontology structures and allowing semantics to be maintained in the analysis of information. If you're interested in data science space, this is hugely important. Otherwise, we just cannot connect the dots. Just the letter one and the characters O and E mean the same thing. That linkage is about ontologies. So exceeding human cognitive capacity. Can we leverage machine learning? I think this is extremely exciting. Machine learning is a very big topic. I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about it. Uh, AI and machine learning, they're subsets in many ways. And the, sort of the concept here is how do you apply these well? And I'm not going to go into detail, but there's clearly a science and a methodological skill in applying machine learning to think about all those features. As I showed you that data flowing up through that big machine, at the top of it's all exposed as features. You know, genomics are a feature. The characteristics of a, a voxel and an image is a feature. The text, the recorded voice of an interaction between a patient and a physician can be decomposed into features. 
the general structure of managing those features and learning against them is extremely exciting moving forward. It doesn't mean you're going to use deep learning methods all the way across, but the general architecture is quite attractive. And in fact, we're starting to see this, where we go from machine learning paradigms with engineered features extracted and classified, or going straight into deep learning paradigms is a consideration now moving forward. And there's even tools like Google's AutoML. So there's a machine learning tool to help you choose which machine learning tool you're using. It's actually not a machine learning tool, but the point is they're already building methods to help you classify and decide what machine learning tool is appropriate. This feature consumption paradigm with the data streaming becomes a really interesting architecture to contemplate leveraging. This is highlighted in a paper just about last year, March 2018, where they start to bring all kinds of data, image-based data gone through convolutional neural net paradigms, all the way through to traditional response and genomics data, flowing into a common architecture where features which are extremely diverse in their nature are now moving into a framework for discovery and learning. And this paradigm creates a very attractive model where the data flows in raw, it's qualified, it's feature extracted, and learning can happen as a byproduct uh, of that consistent flow of information. And this is a very nice article if you're interested in the topic. Most of the stuff you've heard around CNNs and convolutional neural nets rely heavily on the Euclidean nature of the data, as in images. But now that's being extended into graphs. And the methods by which you can then deal with graph-based data using the same concepts is very powerful in terms of extensibility. There's some computational challenges, but the ability to really deal with data that's well outside just or image-based approaches using things like CNNs is very attractive. This is just uh, from August this year. Very nice overview if you're interested in this article. But can we interpret these things? I mean, it runs through a deep learning platform and we get some predicted outcomes. There's a bunch of coefficients. The vectors are sitting in there. Can we interpret them? Do we need to interpret them? Well, humans like to be able to interpret things, at least some of us. I'm not sure my, some of my kids like to interpret everything. Maybe they overinterpret certain things, but the point is we like to understand how that prediction came about. It's nice to be able to say if you're a doctor or something, well, it's, you know, it's because of this metabolic activity, that's why. It's probably more complicated than that, but it's nice to be able to say that. So the humans like to have interpretability, and so does the FDA. I'll talk about that in a second. But this is quite true uh, in the current paradigm. The reality is we actually deal with a lot of things we don't understand every day. In fact, this great talk by those two individuals, they have an article on, on ArchiveX, I really encourage you. I mean, our machines now have knowledge we'll never understand. And, and maybe it's not about understanding it, it's about knowing the limits of the application. So if you know the data that you use to generate the result, that's kind of bounding the operating range for the, for the application of that model. And so maybe that's what it's about, not necessarily interpretability. Doesn't mean, I think, that if you start to look at the weights, maybe there are some discoverable elements down inside. Those weights are more important than others, and that's very exciting. This article by Moon back from 2009 is worth talking about. If you're in a situation where someone says, I got an analytical method, I don't want to know about your deep learning approach, I don't want to hear about it because I can't understand it. From a healthcare perspective, this article by Moon really talks about the trade off of prediction versus interpretability and the two domains, one prognostic research and one etiological research. And I think this is very helpful. It's, it's, a, it's a tension that exists. Just accept the tension and open up the conversation. There's no right way or wrong way in this. I think this article really does a nice job of covering it because at the end of the day, someone's life is gonna be affected by the decision. How do you decide uh, to use that or not? In fact, the FDA this spring put out an article a proposed regulatory framework for modifications to AI and machine learning based software as a medical device. They specifically say that the medical device regulation was not designed for adaptive technologies. It's designed as a device that should operate as predicted in a consistent way. The idea that it's actually learning from new information in the ecosystem that's operating is something that breaks their evaluation framework. So people were encouraged to put some comments in. I put some comments in. I think many others have put some comments in that says, uh, I mean, we have all kinds of tools that learn in the ecosystem now. Why is this any different? So there's a good conversation going forward that these kinds of tools need to be managed somehow, but exactly how they're managed uh, remains to be seen. So I'd encourage you to look in this space. More excitingly, I mean, what happens if we really start to learn from this system? What if it actually starts to do our clinical science for us? And this is where I think is really exciting that in many ways what we call science today um, will be automated as these platforms move forward. 
And this is a picture of bacon. Not my favorite kind of bacon. This is a different bacon. Um, but back in 1620, he talked about how humans just, they're biased. And the ability of use machines to avoid the bias is attractive. At the same time, we have to make sure we're not putting the machines down directions that are biased because we think they should go that way. We've already seen that in terms of some of the, the uh, voice interpretation and challenges around appropriateness in terms of gender assignment based on what they've learned from in the past and the text they've been taught with. So humans can be really good in many ways, but they're typically biased. That's just the way we are. Machines can try to avoid that, but we have to be careful. So I'm going to go a, little, a few more topics. And this one I think is really the most interesting, is if you think about that machine, the data starts to flow through, and we have this capacity to flow information. We have the capacity to machine learning. There's one very important step before that, and that is who said you could use that data? And this is going to become more and more important part of the conversation. And if you don't get this right, you can build technology all day long and it'll stall. So you all know the Drucker quote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. This is from my experience from a series of failures in the past. When it comes to data, architecture is to strategy as governance is to culture. You can build beautiful stuff, but if the governance isn't clear, it stalls. I'm sure some of you have built technology in the room and experienced that yourself. And then from that point of view, the critical path to value has two really important parts. Data, yes. Structure, yes. Governance and data science. Insights, change, yes, those are barriers. But these two are really key. And I'm not going to talk much about data science because the whole meeting is about data science. I, I thought you'd cover that pretty well. You know, everybody else would. But I'm going to talk a little bit about data governance. And this is huge. Every data scientist has been you know, stuck in the blocks at the beginning of a race because they can't get to the data. Every student has come to a hospital and wasted three of their four months as a summer intern waiting for the data. This is a big problem. It's a huge problem. It's more important than AI and machine learning from my perspective because it needs the data. They need the data. If you can't get the data flowing, it's a big problem. So data science is awesome. Great meeting. Looking forward. I'm going to talk about data governance. Who owns the data? And there's arguably sort of this argument that we've just been giving away a lot of our metadata. We refer to them as the data hoovers. Some people refer to them as that. Hoovers uh, is a vacuum cleaner, not a dam, OK? Just in case you're wondering. OK, it's a dam as well. But a hoover is a vacuum cleaner. And there's actually an emerging realization that data capital owned by the individual is coming our way. The paradigm is emerging, that we own our data. In fact, you know, the recording of information derived from personal assistance, my life record, the creation of true personal data capital owned, controlled, inherited, bequeathed. Wouldn't Roche like to have four generations of healthcare information from like 100 families? Wow, things you could learn. But you had to live to generate it. That's a pretty big investment. In a digital world, the act of changing straight from zero to one and one to zero, owned by individuals, independent of government, driving the next generation of how we approach consent. In fact, there's a lawsuit right now in Chicago arguing that just because it was anonymized by the hospital doesn't mean that they could give their, that data away. Anonymization is not going to be the bar anymore. It's going to go lower than that. And in Europe, we're seeing the development of new regulations that allow us to pull data back or at least have it erased. So what does this mean for healthcare? For an organization that, that wants to treat patients but learn from those patients, we have to figure this out. Because if we can't you know, work with the patients to deliver on the next agenda, then what's the future of academic health science centers? This problem has to be figured out. And if we're not careful, we can run into some trouble. Although I think they've managed it fairly well. And the patients and the pathologists that question the use of patient data, even if it was anonymous, without their knowledge in a profit-driven venture. These conversations will continue. So this is like a fidelity conversation. Which data? Which information? For what purpose? For how long? Did you give it away? Did you just let them borrow it? What does that mean? That's a technology conversation as well. And people want to learn from what's happening in the real world. This is very valuable when a toxicity happens to learn from that. Drug companies benefit because they can now stop the use of that drug potentially and avoid risk. Patients benefit. Populations benefit. 
So real world data is a paradigm that's very exciting for many people because a lot of the tests we do on the value of medical practice are kind of contrived. We generate matched cohorts and we compare one result versus the other. That matching may not apply everywhere. We'd like to have data from the real world informing us, so-called real world data. But how can we even access that information? The machinery is not necessarily there. And this is turning into a, a good conversation. Who owns the data? Many people in the academic world, data scientists included, would love to have open data. Lots of data, you can run algorithms against and learn. That's attractive, but it's very challenging when people start to realize the value of that information moving forward. So how do we manage it? And so in many ways, I think of data governance in the dorm room kitchen. Uh, anybody here live in a dorm room any time in the past? Put up your hand. Okay, there's a couple honest, a couple many more. This is from my own personal experience in the summer of 1988, is that an asset with ambiguous ownership and oversight will be poorly utilized. No one in charge of the kitchen, the kitchen becomes not usable. Similar issues around data. So if we can start to have the mechanisms to manage the data well, could we actually get it moving and have it fully utilized? It's a technological stretch to see whether we could do that. But from my perspective, it's a critical investment from the development of new technologies. I refer to these as data governance technologies. We need technologies to govern data. Data governance is referred to in, in this description. This is from Gardner. They do some good work. Specification of decision rights, accountability framework to encourage desirable behavior in evaluation, creation, storage, use, archive, and deletion of information, processes, roles, and healthcare in particular has been very far behind in this paradigm. In fact, um, in general, in healthcare, image data governance or information governance programs are less prevalent than in other contexts. Most organizations have not yet established comprehensive strategies for information governance. Information governance framework and its foundational components call for strengthening expansion, and the life cycle process is not mature. Despite IOM's encouragement and going in this direction, we're not really there. But there are best practices. I'm not going to dwell too much on them. I'm sure you've seen some of these elements before putting together the concepts around when the data is collected, who can curate it, who can make decisions on its access at an enterprise scale, but also at an individual scale. And concepts around single source of truth, lean governance so it's not too heavy, these are all paradigms that need to be pursued if you're gonna build up a governance framework within your organization. It's, it's like a maturity measure in many ways. And it's even further in the research context. The scientists working in the lab on tissue derived from those patients and their good ideas have joined together to make an observation that's critical, developing new intellectual property. All that structure in terms of governance is challenging. And we've seen many organizations, including the federal government, encourage us to share data. Once we publish the paper, put it out for sharing. But even those mechanisms aren't yielding. We really need to mature methods that allow us to do this in a more robust fashion. And I'd argue that if you don't get that front end going, if you don't get clarity around how you're gonna manage the data, either it's owned by everybody, which I don't think will go over very well, or we need an accounting system, like a banking system, like the British banking system that when it expanded, activated entire economies around the planet. We need a, we need a structure for a data economy to start to come to life. And there's many advantages. Data governance sounds great from a learning perspective, but also relevant from a cybersecurity and partnership perspective. I'm not going to dwell too much on that. The most interesting thing that I think I've seen so far in the data governance space and suggest that data will start to move is this kind of unpatient paradigm, where they're actually saying to patients, agree to donate, give you, they go to the patients directly. They're not going to the health organizations, they're going to the patients directly. And this illustrated very nicely in the Parkinson's project on uh, highlighted in Nature Biotech, in a period of three months, they enrolled 11,000 patients. So there's an appetite for engagement when you direct to patient. I think it's really interesting. So we did a little experiment in Toronto and Ontario, and I'm gonna share it with you in a second, in my last few minutes that I have here, um, about uh, what could we do in terms of a consent technology that would allow this to start to happen. So we used some blockchain technology to, sh to do it. I think it's really interesting and uh, learning. Just like in, in here in the United States, I suspect this resonates with you in terms of your healthcare data. Many people think that in Canada, there's just one big igloo and all the data is in there and everybody uses it. This is not true. There's hardly any igloos left. 
and the data is all broken into these sort of structures that are very hard. In fact, we tried to get all the data together, and we gen in fact, the government paid us to try to get the data together. It was very difficult to do. It was this giant sh spreadsheet of decisions and sign-offs because this, they've kind of created a labyrinth that sort of encrypts things from an approval perspective. So we tried to come up with something different. In fact, in Canada, you're allowed to see your data. And in the United States, in fact, it's not so clear state by state on medical record ownership, but I think this will go very quickly. I think very clearly the patient will have control of their data, like in New Hampshire. Um, but I think it'll come. But this paradigm is a whole bunch of new and exciting new technologies I'm gonna highlight in a second. And this in particular relies on the use of blockchain. And I'm gonna just go a little quicker than I run out of time. But the concept here is that every individual could be engaged, empowered, and participatory, unleashing the value through data governance technologies. And I'm gonna illustrate it in, a, in a, an example. And many people talk about privacy, but in fact, I like to break that in half. It's security and consent. If secure, I'm good. The question is consent. Who can use it for what? And give me the fidelity and the decision-making process. That's really what we mean by privacy, security and consent. So we brought a bunch of patients together and we talked to them, what, what would this mean? Like, if you could really have the fidelity for sharing information in a controlled fashion, how would we use it? And we came up with a whole bunch of different use cases, but the one that we settled on was using blockchain to allow patients to participate in research trials in a very controlled fashion. I'll show you the video in a second. We learned a lot from the patients. Of course, you know, they wanted visibility. They wanted to have a view on the transaction. They want to have trust, really important. And they want to have control and access. And we went with blockchain in many ways because the health data was all decentralized, but we wanted to have a decentralized control system that allowed patients to provide the fidelity. And I won't go into detail around blockchain. I'll let you explore it. There's many videos on YouTube that you can listen to over and over again on blockchain. It takes you a few times to go through them. But the concept is it's a distributed date ledger that's secure and can't be tampered with. Let's just put it that way. I have other descriptions as well. So we just tried this. We took all those igloos of data all across Ontario, hospitals and the government, it's distributed all over the place. And we took a bunch of applications that all hit those and wanted to hit that data because right now they can't. And we inserted a data consent layer between the two based on blockchain that allowed individuals to control access that information in a controlled fashion. And we could use it for all kinds of applications, but we did it just for one simple one, a patient and a researcher trying to reach out to them to gain access to their information. And I'm gonna show you the video. I have 50 seconds left, apparently. This is Sue Pierce. She's a fictional character. She lives in Peterborough. It's not that cold in Peterborough. It's very pretty right now. The leaves are changing color. She received specialty care in Toronto. Her husband passed away seven years ago. She has two kids. She's comfortable with technology. She travels once in a while. She has heart disease. And she has a trust, to trust tolerance that sounds a lot like my mom. She's cautious due to headlines, concerned about third parties selling and profiting from her data. If that resonates with you, put up your hand. A lot of people have been that similar. So we just did this little illustration. This is a movie. On the left side, it says Ontario because that's where I did the work. We created an app for Sue to use to control access to her data. On the right side is a researcher dashboard, someone who would like to have Sue participate in a clinical trial. And one thing that I'm hoping that you'll see at the end of this, which is almost done, uh, is how simple it was to bring a lot of different decisions together around technology that simplified a perspective. So I'm just gonna watch this. So here's Sue, she has her app, she's gonna log in. Her name's Sue Pierce. We didn't use any kind of identity management system, we just did something simple just to make the case. There's Sue, she's logging in, she has a password. She's pretty good, there we go. She logs in. And this is her consent list to all the data in the province. Her two sons have access to the information. And one of her friends and her three clinicians, a home care nurse, cardiologist, and neurologist. No research access at this point in time. Sunny Lamb went with her to Europe. And when she was in Europe, she wanted Sunny to be able to bring up her record in case something happened to her. So she had consented to her. But then she decides to turn it off because they're back from Europe. That's attractive. So there, she doesn't have access anymore. All of her consent information controlled by an app. Isn't it interesting? She can look that she turned Sunny's access off or on. In fact, it doesn't have to be all the access. You could turn any 
records off and on, conceptually. She decides that she wants to participate in research. She wants the researchers to be able to find her, find ability. And you can see, this is IBM supported us in their indie platform for blockchain, showing the blocks updating and so on and so forth. Seeing the consent and the transactions that are being recorded. Very simple. Now we're gonna go to our researcher, James Brown. That's not actually the name of the researcher. We just chose that arbitrarily. Put the password in. His view. He knows that because a number of people have been have made themselves findable for research, have agreed to be eligible. There's 875 for the data that he's seeking of the 2,500 made eligible, looking for 10 individuals, post the mechanism, start recruitment. The platform for con accessing consent is on the left, of course. Sue would then be made possible for her to see a request. The request comes through on the platform, a cardiac arrest study. Descriptions of the consent, the documentation for it. The specifics of the kind of information that she's agreeing to allow and the nature of the consent given. Register then on the researcher side. The paradigm being where you have detailed fidel high fidelity con uh, control of the access information. Just illustrating, we actually went through the mechanism, used a fire-based approach to pull the data out of the databases, which is well developed now, well structured. So the paradigm operates now within the Ontario context, not running at scale, but illustrated. The response we've got now from clinical trials organizations and researchers as a mechanism, the simplified consent all the way from a circle of care conversation all the way to a conversation on research in the same platform really resonated with people. So I'm going to stop there. My next slide is just the summary. Growing realization that we need an alternative approach to accelerate progress against cancer while also driving performance and efficiency in healthcare. We need to pivot our thinking and architecture to align with the reality of the digital advantage. That's a piece we need to move on. Move beyond the promise of big data. But also, fundamentally, if we don't get the governance framework in place, we won't have the data moving through. We won't be able to extract the insights that we think we need to move things forward. Thank you for your attention. We're learning a little bit behind, but I do want to take offer in a couple of questions if we have that. Is there any quick questions? I'm going to run back here by the microphone. Hi, thank you for your talk and welcome to MD Anderson. Yeah. Um, so about the, the availability of the data, um, I know it's hard for outside companies to get access to the data. You made that very clear and it's a true problem. But companies like Walmart and Wells Fargo and other companies, Uber especially, are investing tons of money into data scientists to be able to do their work. Cancer research, in my mind, maybe this is controversial, is way more important than any of that. Why are hospitals not investing the same money to bring in data scientists who can do that work, who can get access to that data, like you see with Walmart? This is where we have to go. I mean, there's no question. I mean, we need to make investments to use the information to guide decision making. I think from the point of view of incentives, I mean, not necessarily been there in the same way. I mean, if, we, if we're funded according to outcomes, then clearly we'd be incentivized to more to go that way. But uh, from my perspective, that's the direction we have to go in. It's, there's no question. And we should partner with other organizations on the data science frameworks. And that's one of the reasons I'm here. Uh, we need to build relationships and engage with academics, with industry, new technologies and approaches. At some level, I think it's outcomes driven. I mean, if, you, if you're really funded by the outcomes, I mean, you want to have the data to drive the decision making, and that should lead to better outcomes. I mean, it's evidence that we want. So I think. There's a shift. Um, we need resources to do it, though. One more question right here, and then we have to move on. I really liked your consent app, but does it really connect all the way through? So to give you an example, when a specimen, a, a cancer specimen, comes to the pathology lab, will I know that this person has consented and this other person hasn't? Well, I mean, the paradigm there is that we use this, the blockchain framework, between any information reservoir data. Tissue is another interesting piece because uh, you run out of it eventually. Um, but there's nothing that prevents you from putting this layer between any data source and any consumer of that data source. Um, once the information's out, there's another challenge, how you manage that. But there's no reason why you couldn't put such a layer between any data source and any consumer. And the nice thing about it is that, that, that control system is in the control of the individual. Yeah. 
I, I suggest we take that offline because the, Dr. Jeffrey will be around here so we can move on and try to get back on schedule. <laughs> uh, let's thank uh, Dr. Jeffrey again. Uh,